Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast about foreign policy and world affairs. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. And in this show, we discuss topical global issues, have conversations with foreign affairs thought leaders and newsmakers, and give you the context you need to understand the world today. Go to globaldispatchespodcast.com to learn more. And now on with the show. Lujan Al-Hathloul is a 31-year-old Saudi women's rights activist currently in jail. She was first arrested in a protest advocating for the right of women to drive in Saudi Arabia, and she's been detained by Saudi authorities since she attended a meeting at the United Nations focused on women's rights and equality back in 2018. In early January 2021, she was handed down a nearly six-year prison sentence, though much of that sentence was suspended and she may be released as early as February or March. Her potential early release is likely due to international diplomatic pressure, including from the incoming Biden administration. On the line to discuss her case and what the persecution of Lujan al-Hathloul can tell us about the future of Saudi Arabia is Sari Bashi, consultant with the advocacy group Dawn, Democracy for the Arab World Now. We discuss the history of Lujan al-Hathloul's activism and the circumstances around her arrest, detention, and conviction. This includes allegations of torture and sexual assault. We also discuss what her story and experience says about the Saudi kingdom under Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and how international pressure on human rights can yield results. I've been wanting to do an episode about this situation for a while and uh, thankful that Sari Bashi was able to speak with me and I think you'll appreciate this episode and learn a lot from it. I know I did. And I do want to say that I recorded this conversation before the horrific events in Washington, D.C. unfolded, and I plan on having an episode that takes on that catastrophe in some meaningful way, so stay tuned for that. And as always, feel free to email me. You can do so using the contact button on globaldispatchespodcast.com. You can recommend someone for me to interview or a topic you want me to cover, or you know if there's any Thing else on your mind you wish to share, please do feel free. I do appreciate hearing from you and learning from you, and I will get back to you. These are you know, kind of distressing times, so if there's anything I can do to help, please let me know. All right, now here is my conversation with Sari Bashi. So, Lujain al Hathloul is a 31 year old Saudi women's activist. Um, she was born in Saudi Arabia, but has also uh, been educated and spent time in Canada and France. Um, she comes from a supportive and I would say progressive family. Um, so from an early age, she began to be interested in women's activism, specifically uh, the right of women to drive in Saudi Arabia, ending the male guardianship system in Saudi Arabia, which requires women to get permission from either a husband or a father or some other man in order to do very basic things like get a job or leave the country, uh, and also um, protections for domestic violence. Uh, and what do we know about how she got her start in in activism and what her early years looked like as an activist? So, I mean, she grew up in different parts of the world. And I, I would guess that, you know, seeing the way people live in France and being educated in Canada influenced um, the way that she uh, saw um, women's rights in Saudi Arabia. Because, of course, when she was uh, outside of Saudi Arabia, she could move around in a much freer way um, than she was able to do in Saudi Arabia. Um, through her university studies, she began to study social issues and she really developed uh, a fairly um, well thought out theory of um, women's rights in Saudi Arabia. Uh, And for her, I think a big um, focus was women needing to be treated as as adults. Um, So she um, early on was arrested um, for driving into Saudi Arabia. And rather than being put in a jail or a prison, she was put in uh, what was called a delinquent home, 
for girls and women uh, whose gar- male guardians had um, abandoned responsibility for them. So the idea is in the way that we uh, we take children who misbehave and we put them in juvenile delinquent homes um, in, in the West. So if a child uh, commits a crime, we, we don't put them in prison, we put them in a delinquent home with the understanding that they're not yet fully responsible. That's what Saudi Arabia was doing to women and that's what it was doing to Lujain. And so women who uh, left the house without permission, women who disobeyed their fathers or their husbands were put in this delinquent home. And for Lujain, it was a recognition that women in Saudi Arabia need to be treated as as full human beings, um, as as equals uh, to men. And I think that um, certainly influenced the course of her activism. Another thing that I think is, is, is very important to say about her is that although she herself came from a supportive family, her, her family, her, her husband were supportive, she also recognized that um, domestic violence was a very big problem in Saudi Arabia. And one of the things that she did was try to establish a, a shelter uh, for female victims of domestic violence. Can we uh, unpack just a, a bit this idea of male guardianship in uh, Saudi Arabia? One of the key issues against which she, uh, you know, was, was protesting was an activist to try to end. Um, you referenced it a, a little, a little bit, but how ingrained is it in Saudi culture and in Saudi law? So there have been some improvements, and I would say thanks to women like Lou Jane in curtailing the most egregious aspects of the guardianship system, but it, it's very ingrained both in law and in culture. Um, so uh, it, it's worth saying that requirements um, such as uh, formal permission from a husband in order to leave the country or in order to work or in order to be even be released from prison, those have been recently abolished. There are still many aspects of Saudi law that force women to comply. Um, So, for example, uh, disobedience um, to a a husband or a father can be a crime in Saudi Arabia, meaning that if a woman decides to get a job in violation of what her husband or father wants, she could still be vulnerable under the law. Beyond the law, there is culture. For decades, women have been legally restricted. And while some of those restrictions have been removed, there is still a very strong cultural sense that women need to obey. And certainly when the Saudi state prosecutes and even tortures women like Lujain for arguing that women should be equal, it sends a very strong message to women and men in Saudi Arabia about what a woman's place is. Uh, So she had previously been arrested or detained for driving uh she opened this woman's shelter so at some point she was very much on the radar of saudi authorities um like what do we know about the government's response to her activism in the early stages of that activism so the Saudi government in the beginning did to Lu Jane what it did to many activists, which is issue warnings. So, for example, she was invited to speak to the UN Committee on the Implementation of CEDAW, the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And the government warned her not to travel, and she traveled anyway. Mm. And they let her travel, but a few weeks later, they arrested her. That was in May of 2018. Ah, okay, because because the the CEDAW conference is usually in late spring around the UN. So upon returning back to Saudi Arabia, she was arrested for having spoken at the United Nations. She was arrested and charged with uh, terrorism and cyber crimes, but those cyber crimes included uh, having contacts with foreigners. Um, so it wasn't only CEDAW. She was also accused of applying for a job at the UN as a, a crime that merited prosecution in a terrorism court. So, I mean, I think here it's worth pausing and um, looking at how the Saudi government has addressed uh, women's rights. So um, many people know that the Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, has promised a new vision for Saudi Arabia, a vision 2030, um, that, you know, by 2030, Saudi Arabia would be uh, modernized with equality. Um, What's important to say is that those changes are extremely cosmetic. Um, And they are also predicated on the Saudi government retaining absolute power and crushing any form of independent power or agency within Saudi Arabia. So Lujain and other women's rights activists 
were arrested, for example, for advocating for the right to drive, even as the government itself abolished the law preventing women from driving. Um, so th the idea is that some additional freedoms will be allowed for women so long as that is tightly controlled by the government and any form of uh, independent civil society, uh, freedom of speech, uh, journalistic freedoms or independent activism will be very, very harshly crushed. So like rights are given to you by the crown prince. They are not something that you can advocate for and hope to achieve. That's the message. Correct. And those rights are very, very limited. So yes, women can drive and that's helpful, but they can't speak out and criticize the government and they are still subject to discriminatory laws. So she was arrested in uh, 2018, May 2018. Um, what do we know about the circumstances of her detention? You said she was arrested for cyber crimes and charged in a terrorism court. Um what can you say about sort of what has happened to her and what we know about her you know, condition? Sure. So she was arrested on May 15th, 2018. No charges were brought against her for 10 months. She was simply held. The first 35 days of her detention, she was held incommunicado with no ability to contact her family. So she was essentially disappeared. And she was held in an informal detention center, not a prison. In that detention center, she was tortured, she was threatened with uh, death, she was sexually assaulted, um, and only then was she brought to a prison. How do we know uh, about her torture and about the sexual assault that she endured? Yes. So the first thing I should say is that her reports of torture and sexual assault are unfortunately consistent with the reports of other women rights activists who were also held both in formal and informal detention centers. She herself reported the torture and sexual assault to her family when she was allowed to meet with them. And other women who were detained in the same uh, informal detention center reported uh, witnessing the torture. So they saw um, men going into her room and sexually assaulting her. Uh, they heard the screams and they themselves reported seeing that kind of torture in the detention center. She reported the torture to the Saudi Human Rights Commission, a delegation of, um, of women who visited her in prison. And one of those commissioners include um, Amal Al-Mualimi, who is now the Saudi ambassador to Norway. When she reported the torture, the Human Rights Commission told her nothing could be done, and they did nothing. Only after the torture became um, publicly known uh, just, just last month, the uh, judge in her case um, ordered a so-called investigation into the torture allegations. The attorney general denied those allegations. Uh, the judge um, last month uh, gave her a report um, denying the torture allegations and asked her to respond to that report that day, giving her no time to prepare. When she didn't respond because she couldn't, the judge then um, issued a final report declaring no torture had been committed. And so, how was it that this torture became publicly known? Was it through her, her family? Yes, her family has been very, very vocal. Her parents are still in Saudi Arabia, and they are actually representing her or were representing her in her trial. Her sisters are outside Saudi Arabia, and they have been very vocal in, in begging the world to pay attention to this brave woman who is being horrifically abused. Yeah, I follow one of her sisters, at least on, on Twitter, um, which has been as you know, a wealth of information about her condition, I'd say. Yes. At some point, you know, her arrest, her continued detention uh, became something of like a, 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 a international affair. Um, how did this, how did her situation, how did her case become internationally known and become something that human rights groups and women's groups around the world uh, started to pay attention to? So first of all, let's start with who she is. She is a very impressive 31-year-old woman who took tremendous risks in order to fight for women's rights in Saudi Arabia. And unlike many activists, she did it under her own name. And she did it even when it became clear that she might pay a very, very heavy personal price. And, and just to, to emphasize that, <clears throat> at a certain point in the prison, 
the Saudi, the Saudi government came to her and said, if you will make a video in which you say that you were not tortured, we will release you. And she refused. So this is a very brave woman who is worthy of all of this attention. But the other thing we should mention is that her family um, includes people outside of Saudi Arabia who have very good connections with Westerners. Um, their English is good. Their French is good. And they have been very active in publicizing her case. And her sisters have been able to be that active because they are outside of Saudi Arabia. So they have some modicum of, of, of freedom from the Saudi government or safety from the Saudi government. I also want to say that, look, Lujena Al-Athlul is a, a, a beautiful, young, articulate woman who can easily become a cause celeb. There are many, many, many other detainees in Saudi Arabia who are uh, jailed, who are being tortured, who are being prosecuted for the same kind of peaceful freedom of expression and activism that Lujain Al-Athlul is engaging in. And we should remember them as well. We are speaking uh, just, uh, I guess, a few days after uh, it was announced that she was sentenced uh, for these crimes that she had previously been charged with in 2018. Um, can you explain sort of what the sentencing was, you know, what, what has transpired in recent days? Sure. So she was arrested in 2018. She was charged in 2019 after 10 months of being held with no charges. And only now um, has she been uh, convicted in an accelerated uh, trial. And so there is speculation that the Saudi government decided to accelerate um, her proceedings after holding her for more than two years uh, out of concern for the international outcry. And that the sentence, which the end of which is that she'll be released pretty soon, was a response to that outcry. So the message to, to me and to other activists is that we need to make as much noise as possible to apply this kind of pressure. Um, in December, after the case sitting with very little happening for years, there was all of a sudden an accelerated process. Um, she was uh, she was she was tried on these charges. She was convicted of crimes that include um, using the internet to disrupt public order, uh, having ties to people with a foreign agenda. She was sentenced to five years in prison, but they uh, suspended part of the sentence uh, as a like a parole period. So given the time she's already served, she is due to be released on February 21st in about a month and a half. She was also um, handed a five-year travel ban. So even after she is released, she will be unable to leave Saudi Arabia for at least five years. And her parents are also under a travel ban. And she's on probation. So if at any point in the next two and a half years, she is seen as committing any crime and a reminder applying for a job in the UN is considered a crime, then she can be returned to prison. And the implication, it would seem, of her suspended sentence, you know, being being sentenced to five or six years in prison, but she will only serve, she, she will ostensibly be released from jail in mid-February, is uh, that the Saudi government, MBS, doesn't want to kick off the Biden administration with this kind of looming large over U.S.-Saudi relations because of the noise and the activism around her her detention has you know inspired a lot of you know people around the world to kind of rally to her cause uh, is that sort of a fair assessment you'd say of the kind of politics of this Yes, it, it seems to be that. Um, and, and I will say that many other detainees are are still rotting behind um, Saudi prison cells without that benefit because their cases have not made it out in the way that hers has. Um, the, the incoming Secretary of State for the United States, Anthony Blinken, has uh, has tweeted that what is happening to Lujain is unfair. There, there have been um, in the past previous statements from, um, from President-elect Joe Biden suggesting that he was going to take a time her stance towards Saudi Arabia. So certainly the Saudi government is positioning itself vis-a-vis -vis the United States and is concerned about what the United States thinks about um, Saudi Arabia's human rights record. 
what I want to mention here is that the United States government is the biggest weapon supplier to Saudi Arabia, and its military and diplomatic backing are what allows the Saudi government to engage in this crackdown against activists. And so there are good reasons for Saudi Arabia to care about what the United States thinks. And a central test for the Biden administration will be how does it treat Saudi Arabia and does it continue to help Saudi Arabia crack down on human rights and freedoms? Uh, And what does this whole situation with Lujain tell you uh, about first sort of the, the sort of politics in Saudi Arabia today and also about the trajectory of any sort of opening or improvements that in human rights or opening of of Saudi society that MBS has, has sort of touted recently. So the Saudi government has made it very clear. Um, it wants uh, economic development. It wants uh, a more um, progressive, attractive culture inside Saudi Arabia that would include women driving, uh, openness to uh, Western singers and entertainers coming, uh, hosting sports events. But it intends to crack down with an iron fist on any source of independent power within the kingdom. And here, Mohammed bin Salman is much, much worse than any predecessor. The the crackdowns we've seen in the last few years are unprecedented in Saudi history. Um, There is no independent civil society inside Saudi Arabia. Independent thinkers, journalists, writers, activists have either been jailed, murdered, exiled, or terrified into silence. So the trajectory is very, very poor. The question is, what is the United States going to do about that? You know, the Saudi government is so strong because it has U.S. backing. Uh, President Trump was was quoted as saying uh, about Mohammed bin Salman in the wake of the uh, Jamal Khashoggi killing, we saved his ass. Well, yeah, that's what the American government is doing. And so the question is, will the U.S. government continue to give the Saudi government permission and the tools it needs to prevent democracy and to stifle freedom? And and, I mean, do you think it will? I mean, you know, the U.S. relationship to Saudi Arabia seems to have been pretty consistent for the last, you know, 50 years. I mean, do, do you do you see the fundamental relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia changing to one in which um, human rights is is actually prioritized in word and deed? So, I mean, I think you, you raise a good point that there is an inflection point, but I do want to be cautious in the level of optimism. So in the short term, I am optimistic that there will be more of a nudge toward reigning in the most egregious forms of behavior. So certainly it would be very helpful if the United States government signals that it expects um, some detainees to be released, that it expects better treatment, that it it wants to limit um, some of Saudi Arabia's abuses. And a, a major thing to look at is the Saudi-led coalition's war in Yemen, um, which is supported by American weapons and American logistical support. And so there, I think I I would look to see whether the United States government uh, applies pressure on um, the Saudi government to end that war, um, because the Saudi-led coalition is committing war crimes in in Yemen. And a majority of the 12,000 civilians killed in Yemen um, since the start of the war have been killed by the Saudi-led coalition. Beyond that, I I don't think that the Biden administration is going to do what I think needs to be done, which is to end arms sales to Saudi Arabia. But I do think that the growing support within Congress uh, for reining in um, U.S. support for Saudi Arabia will continue. So for the last uh, four years, there's been a a push-pull between uh, Congress and the United States, where Congress, for example, has um, tried to uh, suspend or limit arms sales to Saudi Arabia by the American government, and the Trump administration has ignored those those warnings or those, in some cases, um, congressional mandates. Um, Certainly, Congress passed a law requiring the American government to uh, issue a, a report Um, explaining what it knows about responsibility for the murder of um, the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi in the uh, consulate, the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Um, American intelligence um, officials believe that Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, was responsible for that murder. And the Trump administration has been defying that law and refuses to uh, issue the report. So 
I think we'll continue to see that kind of push pull. And I think that that uh, growing awareness within Congress that the relationship needs to change could lead to change over the longer term. So maybe not in the next few years, but hopefully further down the line, the American uh, government will um, realize that propping up dictators and preventing democracy in Saudi Arabia is not only morally wrong, it doesn't serve any legitimate American interest. Uh, Well, sorry. Thank you so much for your time. This was very helpful. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Sorry. That was very helpful. And as I said at the outset, please do let me know if there's anything on your mind, if there are any topics you want me to cover, people you want me to interview, I'd love to hear from you. You can do so using the contact button on globaldispatchespodcast.com. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Bye.